Hello and welcome to Insight Germany. My guest this week is from Cameroon and came to live here in Germany in 1994, not really sure of what she wanted to do professionally. Today, Are Kono is an international fashion designer with her own label and her creations are sold in 35 countries around the world. So let's find out how she made it in the cutthroat world of fashion and why she came here to Germany and stayed. <laughs> Welcome to the program. Um, yeah. First of all, you look incredibly chic, of course. Is this your own creation? Oh, yes. This is mine, and this is mine, and this, um, I don't know, it's from some of the brand. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we won't mention any other brand. Other than... Well, actually, I mean, you obviously like to wear your own design clothes, but you don't wear them all the time. Do you have another favorite designer? Yeah, I do. I mean, favorite designer in the sense of um, I really admire this designer. He's called Nicolas Gesquieri from Balenciaga. But um, I don't buy, you know, mainstream brands. Um, I, I prefer to wear my own design and um, it's, um, it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to see, we're, we're, during the show, we're going to see a, a, a lot of your designs uh, during the show. But I want to ask you about... Um, Coming to Europe, we'll talk about, you come from Cameroon originally. Yes. When you were 20, you came to Europe. Yeah. Why? Um, actually, it's um, traditional. Traditionally, in my family, everyone went to study abroad because um, I'm English-speaking Cameroonian. And when I left Cameroon, we hardly had any universities, um, English-speaking univers universities. So my father, my uncles, everyone went to study abroad. They all went to either America or England or did both. So I had to go somewhere in Europe and, um, and I'd been in boarding school. I spent half of my life in boarding school and I was just tired of being with the same people. So I thought, um, where could I go where, where no one is going because everyone went to, to, to America or England. And I thought Germany would be a cool place. It's a strange reason because people try, go to different countries because of the, the, the language is easier or they have family there or they're in love with somebody. That was my reason why I came to Germany. Yeah. 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 And, but, and you, you came and studied at various Goethe Institutes. Yes. Somebody. Yes. So was that the sort of primary thing to learn the language first of yeah, all? Yeah, I had to. I had to learn German. I mean, this was my um, um, first um, um, priority because um, I wanted to study translation. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. And actually did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you, I know you went to Rotenburg ob der Taube. Yes. Which is, I mean, you think it's a movie set, don't you, really? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So was that... It doesn't look real at all. It was, was amazing. Yeah. I was like, um, I mean, I didn't really know Germany, so um, I thought, this is Germany. You know, I thought really? the whole of Germany looked like that. <laughs> that was the first place I went to and I was so fascinated, you know, because German um, Goethe Institute just have like amazing service for their students. You know, we lived um, in the hostel, like in hotels, they took care of everything. And um, I remember it was the first time I saw snow in my life. You know, I was we were on the way to, to, to okay. school and I had um, a British girlfriend and she was walking ahead of me and I saw snow on her hair. And I said, hey, Sue, um, you, you, your hair, you didn't wash your hair. It's, it's, uh, there's some white stuff on it. And she said, shut up. <laughs> Can't you see it's snow? <laughs> you know, I was so fascinated. I was yeah. just like so excited, you know. Yeah. It was funny. Yeah. <laughs> and from Rodenburg and the Tower, I think, Kimse or... or uh, Queen of Kimse. Yeah, and then... Berlin. And then Berlin, exactly. And, and why Berlin? Why did you come to Berlin? Um, because actually, my, my I wanted originally I wanted to come directly to Berlin, but I didn't have a, you know Goethe Institute was very popular in those days, and I didn't have a place in, in Berlin. So that's why I went to Rotenburg first, and mm. then to to Prien am Chiemsee, and then finally had a place in Goethe Institute Berlin. So actually, originally, I wanted to come to Berlin. And was there a special feeling of Berlin? I mean, you've been it here. Ins it was sort just of instinct, since. you know. I was yeah. just, um, it was my, just my instinct, you know, like just, just could be the most interesting city in Germany because everyone was talking about Berlin. When I was mm. in school, you know, when we did history, it was all, Germany was just Berlin, you know. No one talked about Bonn in no. history books, okay. you know. So, okay. um, yeah. so, I mean, this was somewhere in my memory, this was somewhere in my memory, so I think... Um, 
I didn't, you know, I was young and I just didn't care. I just wanted to go to Berlin and enjoy life. <laughs> okay. That's a good cue. Time to find out more about Are Kono's life since she came here to Berlin. <laughs> Ari Kono first became inspired by Berlin shop windows 12 years ago. She originally came to Berlin as an interpreter and soon fell under the spell of the German capital. Her fascination with the out of the ordinary and her hard work and stamina made it possible for Kono to establish herself in the fashion industry, which is a tough go for anyone. I've been lucky enough to be successful at what I'm doing. Maybe it's because I see the world differently from people who were born here. I can see a completely different solution to the same problems. I think that's a big advantage. Kono is constantly coming up with new ideas. Seeing Germany and its people from an outsider's point of view gives her the freedom to go her own way. Ten years on, and Kono now sells her clothes in 35 countries worldwide and has two exclusive stores in Berlin. She had no idea she'd stay so long when she first arrived. Luckily, Kono never regarded working around the clock as a chore. It's her passion. Her aim is simple, to make sure that her clients look better in her clothes than they did when they came into her shop. Funnily enough, the woman that I have in mind is tall and blonde, with short hair. She's a prima donna. She has broad shoulders. And she has proper curves, a real woman. And when you look at me, well, I'm quite the opposite, really. <laughs> Ari Kono has made good use of her opportunities. And after 22 years of hard work in Berlin, she's built up her own worldwide fashion emporium. And she's spending a little time with us here in the studio on Insight Germany. You said there, seeing Germany, uh, it's a few years back, admittedly, but you, you said there, seeing Germany from an outsider's point of view is a big advantage. Um, but now you've been here so long, do you still feel an outsider? Um, no, I, I, I realized, you know, sometimes, you know, you're not satisfied, we, most of the time the grass is greener where we're not, you know, and sometimes you, you just like feel like, um, oh, I'd like to be somewhere else. And then I realized whenever I travel, I'm just like happy to go back home and home is Berlin, mm. you know, so um, I still just, just, I'm just like totally in love with this city, you know, and um I wouldn't talk about Germany because I haven't lived everywhere in Germany. I can just well, talk you've, about you've Berlin. You've lived down south. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you've lived in the south. Rodenburg up the tower, that was just like a month and, um, or two, oh, I see. you know. So, you know, and, um, and I felt like a tourist then, you know. And mm. Prinam Kimse was just a month or two as well. And Berlin is like. Um, I, I didn't mention that, but when you first came to Europe, you came to Milan. Yes fashion capital. Yes. But you don't like it very much. No, I don't like Milan. I don't like Milan. Um, I didn't like Milan de then and I, I don't I even like Milan less now. Um, since, Why is that? Um, um, at the beginning, I just had a feeling I couldn't learn anything from the culture. Oops, sorry. It's, sorry, Italy. <laughs> we don't mind. It's, it's, it's DWTV. Um, it was just a feeling. I mean, like, you have great artists and great designers from Italy, but that's a feeling I had. I cannot change this. And, um, and now when I go back to Italy, I, I get really mad sometimes, you know, because I, in Milan, I can't even get a taxi from the streets. I have to, when I go to work in Milan, I take my employees with me. I have to ask uh, my, my blonde employee to, to stand in front of me to, to be able to get a taxi. Oh, for racist reasons? Yes. You can't get a taxi? Yes, they don't take me. And sometimes I get into the taxi and I ask the taxi driver, you know, like, what's your problem? And they start telling me, you know, all these Moroccans um, stealing and, and, and whatever. And I thought I have to be punished for that. You know, I, I, when I get to Milan, it's really Milan, you know, because when you go down to, like, to Florence, it's a bit different. And um, I have fantastic clients in Rome, 
you know, mm. that, that own stores in Rome, you know. And um, if I go to, 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 to Sicily, it's great. But Milan is just, I don't know what's wrong with that city. It's just... Um, Let's keep going south. Yes. <laughs> we'll go to Cameroon. Yes. <laughs> and tell me, um, first of all, where, where you were born in Cameroon? I was born yeah. in, in a town called Limbe. Today it's mm. called Victoria. Yeah, we've got a map of that, I think. <laughs> today it's called Victoria. I thought it was the other way around. Sorry, <laughs> you're right. It was called Victoria. <laughs> Victoria, today's Limbe. Oh, my research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you forgot. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you did bring, I have to say, you bought some of the most gorgeous pictures. This is... Oh, my God. Um, That's me on the left. <laughs> I look like a boy. <laughs> and um, this, the, the girl next to me is my sister. Yeah. And um, the, the, the little boy and the two girls in the middle are neighbours. Yeah. And the girl on the right-hand side is my cousin. And the man... In our house, behind, in the window, is my uncle. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. And now, I guess, this... Now, is this the... F this, this is... These are my brothers and sisters, and that's my stepmom. You know, she was like... She was just... She wore all these plissé dresses, you know. She was... I think she's one of my biggest inspirations as far as the fabrics I use in my design are concerned. You can see that's the plissé dress she wore, and she had lots of them. And yeah. she was always like really glamorous and really, really dressed up. That's my stepmom. So although you came to Europe as a 20-year-old and sort of were going to study German and become a translator, when did the fashion thing, do you think it was always there from when oh, you yeah, were young? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm, I sold my first, my first skirt. I was four and a half years old. Yeah. And as a child, I hardly played because I just spent a lot of time sewing. No one understood because my, my parents were all um, ac academics and um, um, my stepmom, she was um, a professor, my father was an engineer and um, they didn't understand why I just wanted to sew. I sewed for everybody. I sewed for my friends, I sewed for myself and when I got older, if I had a boyfriend, I sewed everything with my hands for them. I bet so you, I just you like... were popular with the boyfriends. <laughs> I'm sure. Now, and I believe, <laughs> I always think of fashion designers uh, draw these wonderful sketches. But I believe you don't draw sketches. You work with a, a tailor's dummy, is that right? Yes, I, I start, I do it the other way around. Yeah. Because these, most designers, they do a drawing and mm. they realise it. And um, I think because I started sewing so early and had to do my own patterns so early, I design actually on the dummy. And... Um, and um, I do the sculptures, and then I do the drawing. And before, most of the time, before I do a drawing, the piece is already completely sewn in my head. So when I do my collection, I just um, put it together, put the pins, and take to the tailor. I don't um, experiment with um, with um, with um, cotton fabrics like most people do. Like do a sample that you cannot use, uh -huh. and then use the real fabric. I start. With the, with the fabric that's meant for the collection. But isn't that quite difficult when, I mean, you've, you've got your own label now, you must have yes. other people making your things for you. Um, I, I mean, if you, you have to do everything around a tailor's dummy yourself. You yes. can't have your, your seamstresses doing that for you, the, obviously. Um, no. Just the samples, just I the see. samples, because they can't see what I, I'm, I want to see. You know, if I do a drawing and give um, a, a seamstress or a pattern maker to do the pattern, they cannot see my vision. Mm. So I, I virtually do um, the, 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 the pieces myself on the dummy mm. and also do the patterns because I work with this special fabric that no one is trained to use. When you got to Berlin, yes. Goethe Institute, learning German, going to be a translator, but you've got a fashion label, so how did that all get going? It must have been tricky. Yeah, um, I, I studied translation just to make my parents happy because um, they didn't believe in, in, in me. You know, we, I'm from Africa, we have other problems than, than making people beautiful, than making clothes. So they didn't understand why. Uh, my, sister, uh, my sister is a lawyer, my brother is a doctor, everyone is doctor, lawyer, engineer, whatever. And they called me a tailor. They said, why do you want to be a tailor? And um, I couldn't give them but an answer. But here it was dif different, presumably, here in yes, Berlin. Yeah, sure. and, and you started... What did you do to get 
I mean, you're you're a, you're a, you're, you're, you're in fashion label. I want to know about. Oh my God, that's such a long, that's a such a long story because um, I worked for 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 I always worked for fashion brands. So the, I worked for a textile designer, but she mm. also had a brand, and um, and I worked for her in her store as a salesperson, um, five days a week or six days a week. And when she had pieces that she couldn't sell for like three, four, five, six years, I took them to the markets for her. And sell them at, sold them at the market. So it's at the markets you yes. started. Yes. Let's, uh, you say it's. A, I'm going to cut I, you as it's a long story, yes. and we're going to cut to showing some of your fashion now. We've got some pictures from um, what was called African Fashion Day at the Berlin Fashion Week. First of all, why do we have an African Fashion Day at the Berlin Fashion Week? Do you think? Um, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I was just happy to be here and to be in Berlin and um, um, my girlfriend, Awuma Obama, she's a patron of the African Fashion Day and Barack she... Barack Obama's sister. Exactly. Yeah. She asked me, um, she said, I'm going to be the patron of, um, of the African Fashion Day. Do you want to join? Do you want to do the show? And I said, if you're part of it, then I'd like to. I didn't really know what it was all about, you know, but she was very optimistic about it and really, really a big motivation for me. Well, it was a slightly loaded question in that, for me, I have, I have no idea about fashion. I'm a man. No, that's not fair. <laughs> but, I, but to me, there seems to be these big fashion houses that I'm not going to name. There's often a lot of African influences. Yeah. But I only know of one, if you like, famous... African fashion designer of African descent, really fair, Oswald Boateng in, in, in England. Yeah. I mean, why do you think it is? There's so much influence, but I don't see designers coming out of Africa itself. Um, it's difficult to explain because um, the, the market is, is, is a problem because the, the big, I think the big designers are using, the big brands are using the, the influence the, to... to, 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 to um, I think there's no market. The yeah. market is very small. Yeah. You know, um, if you look, uh, if you look at people in the streets in Europe, you don't see people wearing the colourful fabrics. You know, we have from yeah. Africa. I think that's where the problem is coming from. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about Berlin as a becoming a fashion capital? Is it becoming what? I mean, when you started, there was fashion wasn't a big thing in Berlin, but it's yeah, no come up an enormous amount yes. since you've been here. Yes. So uh, has it? reached its peak? Um, no, it's, it's, it's um, nowhere close to the peak. It's really, really far away from what's going on in Paris or, or Milan. Do you think it will get that far? Um, these, I can't answer this question because, um, because my experiences, um, in, I show my, my collection in Milan, I show in London, I show in Dusseldorf and I show in Paris. And um, my biggest um, fashion market is, um, is the Arab world. You know, um, and um, and Americans as well. And when I try to get my customers to come to Berlin, they're not coming. Oh. So um, I don't know why. Um, wh when I show in Berlin, you know, I sell. I, I do more business in Paris. I do more business in London. I do more business in Dusseldorf and Milan. And um, the only place where I really do business in Berlin is in my store in the Hakkische Hofe. Okay. Otherwise, um, yeah. interesting. It's um, it, it, the, the, um, I think it's going to come. The business side is going to come. You know, lots of mm. people are coming here to party. Yeah. Berlin is a party city, and um, so I think the the fashion the fashion scene in Berlin has to 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 get more serious. You know, because fashion is not a party; it's a business. Yeah. You know, and um, this is um, it's a problem in Berlin. Okay. My guest is Berlin-based fashion designer Ari Corner, and just the other day she moved apartments and invited us along to the new one. But first, a coffee in her favourite cafe. It's like really great to, to walk in here and, and have a big smile from Mickey, you know, she's like always really happy to see me. <laughs> <laughs> The coffee is really tasty, you can see it real, uh, being brewed and um, it's a great atmosphere. And I came here and met Miki and, and I thought it's, um, it's a women's business. I'm always like, if I see anything that's run by women, I always want to go and, and put the money there. 
I just moved into this um, wonderful place um, two days ago. I live here with my son Aaron and my auntie Mama Lucy. Most of the time I always lived in places which I always found a reason not to like. You know, I think it's just typical in Berlin you know, that we move so often. And, um, and I just hope I find some peace here. And I feel like, you know, as an artist, and I really have a really difficult job, and to get away from the city and just be quiet, you know, it's like really, yeah, it feels like a holiday. This dress is a dress I'm like saving if, um, if, so, if I will be asked, you know, to, to get married. Um, it's what I would love to wear, you know, maybe I change my mind, but I'm saving the dress just for this event, you know. <laughs> To wake up in the morning and look in the water, look in the lake, you know, so I can really start begin my day in a wonderful way. Nature is uh, is just an amazing inspiration um, for me. I don't really need to to travel around the world to 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 get inspired by by different colors. Just sitting here, you know, and um, 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 watching the water and um, seeing the trees move, and I'm always amazed, you know. Um, um, how much, you know, how much information, how much stuff and how much creative um, input you can get. And you may have noticed in that report, this portrait of Ere, um, it was slightly smaller, and this, I have to say, is the original. It's a photograph which has been pixelated, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get a smaller copy signed by our guest to give away. And just write to us at the usual address. That's insight at dw.de. You can also drop us a line about anything you like to do with the show, of course. We love to have praise, but we reluctantly accept criticism as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I don't know whether anybody noticed in that report, but you were talking in your kitchen and your son came past and took the cloth from your aunt and started polishing the glass. And I want to know, on a personal level, how did you manage to get a 12-year-old boy to do that? He's, he's, he's just, um, I mean, it's not because he's my son, he's just amazing, you know. He just spends most of this, his time um, trying to make mom happy. And oh. um, yes, he's, um, he's just so special. And I really sometimes wonder, you know, like where that's coming from, really. How do you actually mix running an international business and bringing up a son at the same time? I mean, it must be tough. Um, discipline, hard work, and um, a strong will, yeah. you know, and to win the race. Well, great respect. <laughs> now, you, also, I heard, we didn't see it in the report, but you have two kitchens, one for African cooking and one for German cooking. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, because, we, you know, we're, um, um, African um, cooking is, you have like lots of very um, strong um, spices, you know, and um, we use like smoked prawns, we use like lots of nuts and they really, really do stink or smell. And, um, and um, I love it when the food is done, but when it's been cooked, you know, sometimes it's a bit irritating. So I um, prefer to have, you know, <laughs> the little kitchen on the side. <laughs> and what do you think of German? Uh, food? Oh, I like wurst, you know. Um, I mean, I decided to become a vegetarian, but I still love wurst. And, um, you can't be a veg... <laughs> I, I decided, <laughs> it's a bit you know, of a problem there. <laughs> I know it's a problem, it? because <laughs> whenever I go by a curry wurst stand, you know, I'm like, oh, I would love curry to wurst, eat, you know. <laughs> famous thing to have in Berlin. I, can I love, I love yeah. Bavarian food as well. You yeah? Know, like, yeah, yeah. I, I love Bavarian food. It's like... We saw you all there, also there, with a wedding dress or a potential, a beautiful dress. Um, you put in your questionnaire that we send out to everybody that you think German men are handsome. Yes, so I think so. Are you, are you, are you waiting for a, 
a handsome German man to come along on a so white charger. So ask me. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about German men that you particularly like? Um, and Germans, there's one um, characteristic that people don't see in Germans. Germans are like hard on the outside and soft on the inside, you know, and um, this I like. And, mm. um, and they come across as, as cold and distant. And, and I mean, as I said, I love Berlin, you know, because people are really uh, nice and really friendly. But it takes the time, you mean? It takes time? It, it takes the, time. It takes time to make friendships? Is that what you're saying? Um, not, not in Berlin. No. Not in Berlin. I wouldn't say so. Not in Berlin. And sort of hard on the outside, soft on the inside, that, that makes a good partner. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Would you live elsewhere in Germany? Um, um, maybe Hamburg, but mm. it's too rainy, you know. And um, I love the freedom in Berlin. You know? I love this artistic side of Berlin. You know? I love the fact that there's always something going on. And you can choose, you know, every day of the week you can choose to, to do something really amazing and something really great. And, um, and I mean, because of my job, um, there's no reason for me to go to Hamburg, you know. Berlin is a place where fashion is trying to get into and, and I'm just happy to be part of it. Mm. Has it taken out? I mean, Dusseldorf, when I came to Germany 20 years, Dusseldorf was the sort of fashion, there isn't a fashion capital in, in but Dusseldorf was the place for fashion. Has Berlin really taken over from that now or is there a different yes. style? Berlin has really taken over because um, I think um, um, Dusseldorf missed out something. Um, um, Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf underestimated the glamorous um, side of, of, of fashion mm. to use this, you know. It was, it was just business in, in Dusseldorf and it's still a little bit. But um, Berlin, you know, used the advantage, you know, as a capital to, to, and the party city. And uh, most of the famous people in Germany live in Berlin and not in Dusseldorf. And they use this red carpet effect, you know. To, and is to, Berlin though glamorous? Yeah, I kind of, you know, in a, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a in a in a Berlin way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, it's um, it's for example, it's very chic to be poor in Berlin. You know that. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. very chic to be poor in Berlin. You know, it's it's very chic to to walk around look, looking scruffy. Yeah. <laughs> than yeah. the other way around. Yeah, you know, there's this so. saying, isn't there, from the mayor of Berlin <laughs> who says, "Poor but sexy." Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, in Berlin, yeah. Now, a couple more pictures. A picture now of oh your... Oh, my God. No, this is, is this your dad? That's my dad um, in Wisconsin. He studied in Wisconsin in the 60s and lived with his family, you know. And um, it's an amazing family because behind the picture, it's written that this was his, his, um, his family. But when they went to church, they were, they were at the front and he had, like, at least five benches in between him and the rest of the church. Really? Yes. But the family themselves weren't like that. They weren't like that. You can see on the picture. Yeah. You know, yeah. they took him like their child, but when they left their, their home, yeah. it was another story. And is this... What's this one? That's me. <laughs> yeah, I look like a boy. Yeah. You always say you look like a boy. You're very feminine. <laughs> I mean, the pictures, I look like a boy. No. With big ears. And that's my dad on the left-hand side and his friends. <laughs> Proud of his daughter in the pram. <laughs> uh, and you went abroad to study. Your your brother, sisters went abroad. I mean, this was My a dad huge, also. huge cost to your family and stuff. Um, or is it just one thing they really wanted to do? Yeah, it, it was. It's, it's tradition, you know. And um, we all went to. Pri I mean, we all went to private schools in Cameroon. You know, we um, for my father, education was very, very important, and he spent uh, um, all his money. You know, not all his money spent, um, everything he could on our education. So this was very... And I believe all your family have left Cameroon, though, now. Why is that? I mean, why you, you haven't been back for a long time. Yes, you know? I haven't been back um, because my father died. Um, I mean, it's a sad story. He died many years ago um, and didn't leave a will. So, and left, like, seven um, houses and... Um, um, I'm scared to get killed oh. if, I, if I go back. Okay. Yeah, I'm scared. Right. I mean, this is the reason why I didn't go back home for so many years mm. since he died, because um, people are living in these houses for, for, without paying rent. Mm. And um, I tried to go, um, I, I tried to go 
like three years ago to show my son where I'm coming from and someone found out and I received an anonymous, a horrible anonymous letter, you know, like really threatening my life and, and the life of my child. So I didn't go back. Okay. So, um, so this is, that's very sad. It's very it's, sad, you know, yeah, because he didn't build those houses for, uh, for this to happen. Mm. No, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you're happy here in Germany. Yeah, hopefully. found a home, yeah. found a new home, yeah. How was it, I want to ask you about, as a woman, setting up uh, a business here. Was, it, was that easy? Did I never feel? saw myself as a woman. I mean, I'm not transsexual <laughs> or a man. You keep saying every photo you see, you look like a boy. But no, no, but I never saw it? myself as a woman I, um, having dis any disadvantages, you know. I just went for, for what I could get, you know. I just worked as hard as I could. Mm. Uh, of course, I was lucky, you know, because um, as I told you before, I, I started selling my stuff at the market, my, my, my clothing mm. at the market, because I mean, I didn't have my parents, my father died years ago, and um, I, it didn't occur to me to go to a bank, they wouldn't have given, given me any money anyway. So I started at the market and got really lucky um, that um, a woman found me and she saw my clothing and she was like, what are you doing here with so much talent? And she got the context for me in I West see. Germany to, to, to start selling my, my collection in the different stores in West Germany. And that's how I was able to leave the market. So um, my story is not just about being lucky and just about hard work. I've been very lucky you know, in Germany and you know, people have been really, really kind to me. You know, Haki Schoehefe is like a, a great address, you know, it's, it's, it's... This is in the middle of Berlin, I should explain, Berlin, this is know. a very cool address. Address, you know, and when I applied to get this tour, there were lots and lots of applications, you mm. know, from lots of people, and they, the, 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 um, the, um, the owners, you know, this, they, they told me, you know, when we saw you, we thought you're the one who has to get this place, you know, and um, so I can't complain about. Why do you think that was? Um, they saw, of course, they saw talent, and um, uh, they saw talent, I think, and um, and I think I was just lucky again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. because they I mean, could have, I... have said, um, no, we don't want you, you know, we want mm. this or this designer, mm. and. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, you most probably don't associate Germany with sun, sea and sand, uh, but there is some beautiful coastline up on the Baltic Sea and this is where one of Are Kuno's favourite spots is. Rügen is Germany's largest island, but wherever you happen to be on Rügen, you're never more than seven kilometres from the coast. Binz is the island's most popular resort. More than a million vacationers from Germany and abroad visit Rügen every year. I'm from Switzerland and he wanted to show me the island. I love being beside the sea. The Baltic has a really magical attraction. One day here in Binz is like a whole week of vacation. Originally a small fishing village, Binz became a tourist destination in 1876, when the first hotel was built. The turn of the 19th to the 20th century saw the rise of a distinctive architectural style common to North German resorts. It incorporated ornate balconies, windows and arches. Today many of the villas have been divided up into vacation apartments. Rügen is perhaps most famous for its chalk cliffs, which inspired the German romantic artist Kaspar David Friedrich back in 1818 when he was there on his honeymoon. The Königstuhl is still the island's best known landmark. The four kilometer long Rügen Bridge takes you to the mainland and to the city of Stralsund. Recent additions to the skyline contrast sharply with the centuries-old brick Gothic constructions. The old town hall is a notable example. The entire old city is a UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. 
And in Stralsund, you'll find a true Baltic tradition. Henry Rosmus is the only person still preparing the world-famous Bismarck herring in accordance with the original recipe from 1871. It gets its name from Otto von Bismarck. Johann Wichmann invented this method of preparation in Stralsund. As a devoted follower of Bismarck, he sent the Chancellor a keg. And Bismarck thanked him by allowing the product to carry his name. Bismarck isn't the only statesman to have tried the marinated fish. Other politicians have sampled the tangy delicacy too. And the best way to enjoy it is with a view of the island of Rügen. My guest is fashion designer Ari Kono, who likes the island of Rügen. Oh, I love it. For the sun, sea and the sand or for other reasons? Yeah. Sorry? For the sun, sea and sand or for other reasons? It's really, you can really be quiet in Rügen, you know. I, I love to go to Hiddensee. There's an island next to Rügen, which is called part of Rügen. Yeah, a little one. It's yeah, called yeah. Hiddensee. And there, there are no cars, you know, you just go on your bike and and um, you can really, really, really relax. And um, this is rare. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And, but it was good to show that because people don't think Germany has coast. Yeah, yeah of course it does. it's a beautiful yeah. coast. Um, we are also noticed in uh, Bismarck herrings. I'm not going to ask you about Bismarck herrings, but about <laughs> the man, because in our questionnaire, uh, it, 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 you said you were a great you were a great admirer of Otto von Bismarck. Why? Um, because of what he did um, for Germany, and um, I thought he was just like really amazing at what he he achieved. You know, the Franco-Prussian War and the unification of Germany in the 19th century. But you know, this high opinion of him, I, ha I just had till like three weeks ago, because <laughs> since three weeks, I started reading um, his l love letters between him and his wife, and um, and I was shocked to see that he wasn't liberal at all. He was anti-Semitic and he was really, really arrogant. And this was quite disappointing, mm. you know. So. Do you read a lot of historical stuff? Oh yeah, Germany? I love, uh, yes, yeah. I love yeah. um, history. Even yeah. when I read books, you know, just for fun, there must, there must be something historical, you know, involved in the stories. Okay. Yeah, many people uh, read a lot of literature. I prefer history. Mm. Yes. But do you read in German? Do you oh, read I, German books or do you read in English? I read in German, I read in Italian, I read in French, I read in English, I read in all the languages I speak, yeah. Wow. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> there was also in that report a, um, a very short picture of Angela Merkel with George W. Bush. Um, you put down in our questionnaire that Angela Merkel is your favourite German but you wouldn't vote for her. I, w I wouldn't vote her party. If she didn't have a party behind her, I'd vote her. But I'm not German anyway, so <laughs> so I can't. Um, I you can't. don't have a, a German passport. I'm Italian. You're Italian. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but would you like to have a German passport? No, I'm not really interested. I'm not really keen. You know. Mm. Um, I mean, having an Italian passport is just the same as having a German one. It's too much hassle. But I mean, you love. I mean, you said earlier in the program you weren't particularly fond of certain. Bits of Italy, and uh, but you you don't want you're so fond of Germany and things yes, like that. Yes, I, I mean this is my home. I mean your favourite music, or <laughs> no, it says favourite song. You like Ramstein. Ramstein. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to explain them to our I mean, audience. Of course, They're I love you know the, like the the big German artists, you know like Wagner and um, you know yeah. all the big ones. But, um, you know, when it comes to, like, rock and roll, I love Rammstein. I think it's very... It's more than rock and roll, isn't it? You know, it's heavy metal. It's, yeah, yeah. it's heavy metal, yeah. you know. <laughs> yes, it's more than rock and roll. It's quite loud. But the one, uh, one that really intrigued me is when we, we asked people to name their favourite German words, you couldn't think of one, but you talked about the language, and you said the language is very glamorous and elegant. Now, I have to say, and I don't want to denigrate the language in any way, it's a wonderful language, but I've never heard the adjectives used, <laughs> elegant and glamorous. To me, German sounds really, really beautiful, especially the German you, you, you speak in Hamburg. I yeah. think it's very, um, yeah. very um, sophisticated and very, very, very glamorous language. To me, German... It's, for, to me, it's like exactly the opposite of Spanish. 
you know, for example, I don't like Spanish. I don't like the sounds, you know. And um, yeah, it sounds primitive to me as a language. It's interesting because, of course, musically, um, yeah. of course, Germany, a wonderful music nation, and of course, they wrote all the operas and things. Well, some of them were written in Italian, but, you know, there's lots of stuff from Mozart. There's lots of stuff. I mean, I'm thinking of Strauss, I'm thinking of um, Schubert and Schumann, all these wonderful songs written in German, of course. So it's your right to say that it's elegant it, and glamorous. It's very. Do you remember what you put down for the best kept secret in Germany? <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll just start you off. <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's not racist. And yeah. who, who is? And yeah, um, it's, um, it's um, I mean, uh, it's, I can only talk about my experience. I, I know there are lots of people having um, racist experiences um, in Germany. I wouldn't, you know... I I'll have to hurry you because we're yes. nearly over. But, um, yeah. um, but I never looked for a flat or looked for a job. Um, I never um, looked for, um, was looking for a flat or, or trying to get a job I didn't get in Germany. Mm. And uh, I travel a lot in, in... I travel a lot because of my job. I go to... Um, I'm very, very often in Paris and I find the French very racist. And in Italy, uh, um, you know, I wouldn't even get a taxi on the streets in Italy. Yeah, you know, this is quite at all. I mentioned this. And um, I don't have these experiences in Germany. You know, like the flat I moved into now, it's really, really amazing flat. You know, and I saw it and I was like, mm, maybe I'm going to take it, maybe not. And, um, and the owner, she called me and she said, there are lots of people interested in this, in this flat, but I want to give it to you. And I said, OK, then I'll have it. This is a wonderful way to end the show. Ari Kono, top fashion designer, selling in 35 countries. Hope you make it in many more countries, but do stay here in Germany with us. It sounds as though you're going to. Thanks very much for being with us today. And thank, thank you, you very much for watching the show. Uh, don't forget the address to write into is insight at DW. Dot de. That's it for this week. Um, join us again at the same time next week. Bye-bye for now.